So very warm welcome, Justice Mala. Very warm welcome to our audience. Um, very warm welcome our students. And some of you have been with us for the six previous lectures in this Global Environmental Law Lecture Series. And I'm delighted that today we've got Justice Mala from the Supreme Court of Nepal joining us. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to sharing, uh, for sharing your thoughts on global environmental law and how international environmental law instruments have been used in your jurisprudence. I would say a few words about your curriculum vitae, if I may, and then I will hand over the floor uh, to you. Now, Justice Sapana Pratamala has been a judge of the Supreme Court of Nepal since August 2016. She's a former member of the Nepalese Constituent Assembly and also a former member of the UN Committee Against Torture. Now, as a lawyer, she's already a very well-known figure in Nepal due to her work to advance women's rights and increase inclusive language in the country's constitutions. And I think this uh, reputation goes beyond Nepal. As a practicing lawyer and senior advocate before the Supreme Court of Nepal, Justice Mala has contributed extensively as a public interest lawyer for raising voice in a number of cases on a range of issues from the environment concerning water pollution uh, and pesticide cases to civil rights, the right to inheritance, ensuring reproductive health rights, criminalize, criminalizing marital rape, witness protection, maintaining confidentiality, and so forth. And she obtained her LLB from Tripuvan Universities in Nepal and a master's in comparative law from Devi University. And she also obtained a mid-career master's in public administration from Harvard University. She's also a member of the IUCN, World Commission on Environmental Law, and she's a founding uh, secretary general of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. She's also president of the South, Af South, South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation uh, and the Law Nepal chapter. Now, the title of Justice Mala's talk today is The Influence of Global Environmental Law on Nepalese Environmental Law and Jurisprudence. And I'm very much looking forward to listening to your lecture and your insights. And I will hand over the floor to you now. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for, for having us in this um, program. Uh, this has uh, given us an opportunity to share uh, how we have been dealing with uh, environmental matters. And before going to that, uh, in one minute, I want to highlight uh, some of the pressing issues uh, related to environmental justice Nepal is facing uh, at the moment. Uh, Nepali land, uh, like 49% of uh, the land is covered by mountains. We have nine hi highest um, Himalayas of the world. Uh, then we have 45% land uh, covered by the forest, uh, which, is, which plays critical role in maintaining uh, climate justice, not only in Nepal, but even to the region. Uh, but we are also confronting with uh, some of the challenges, uh, which includes glacier melting, water scarcity, water pollution, river pollution, excavation of the uh, um, um, uh, uh, Himalayan rains, uh, mountain rains, forest cultivation uh, for constructing roads and airports. Um, um, uh, we are, uh, as a result, there is a serious implication on biodiversity. Uh, it is also contributing for global warming and climate change. So there are uncountable climate uh, crisis and climate injustice issues, which is resulting in deforestation, landslides, uh, forest fire, flood, earthquake, displacement. Uh, in addition to that, what we have not been able to recognize is a disproportionate uh, effect of um, of uh, climate injustice on women, on uh, marginalized community, on indigenous group, as well as um, we have not been able to address the unmet needs of marginalized uh, population. So one hand, we have a 
we have a um, uh, pressing environmental injustice issues but uh, we also have an opportunity to deal with this especially with uh, rise of environmental litigation uh, in the court uh, that has created opportunity to examine into environment matters and uh, correct the gaps uh, or recognize the violation or recognize the rights and ensure remedies but even uh, before like i want to go to a little bit of history of nepal when there was no law no constitution that uh, recognized environmental right as a as a as a health right or fundamental right um, i'm talking about 1959 um, like even before uh, rio declaration came in place um, uh, in one of the acting chief justice in 1959 in case of jagannath versus delhi ram uh, the the judge uh, said uh, that encroachment and cultivate of uh, cultivation of forest land is illegal uh, we have to protect uh, this forest cultivation to maintain harmony with nature so the term harmony with nature which is used as a principle one of your declaration in 1992 was applied by nepali court in 1959 in another case uh, when explosive were was used uh, to catch fish in the river the court uh, declared it illegal and imprisoned for 6 months under the charge of disruption of uh, public dis uh, public decency as there was no law but what i want to mention here that principle of sustainable consumption was practiced even then and then i would like to mention the last um, case which was critical because in 1964 a case was registered um, uh, by uh, uh, public uh, to protect a uh, uh, um, place in the in the center of city where they used to go for the morning walk and they wanted to make uh, some construction in that area and some people went and filed uh the uh, case to protect uh, their their right to health uh, and in this case majority did not accept the locus standi uh, the dissenting opinion recognized and said it's a violation of right to healthy environment with this case the question of locus standi uh, was raised uh, raised and uh, finally in 1990 when the constitution was uh, adopted after first people's movement in nepal the constitutional constitution itself recognized uh, public interest litigation as an avenue uh, to protect um, uh, the public um, rights and uh, later on court uh, elaborated that and said uh, no meaningful relation and substantial interest with the uh, the litigant has to be established uh, with this uh, expansion and there are large number of cases which are already decided by the supreme court which is related to environmental justice as well as we are still um, um, uh, having lots of pending cases Uh, related to environmental issues so looking at the constitution uh, what uh, the court has been in, has interpreted uh, is like uh, right is founded upon the notion that any harm to the environment can and does adversely affect the enjoyment of a broad range of human rights but then later on after the um, uh, constituent uh, uh, after uh, like we lived in insurgency for 12 years and then for the first time in the history of nepal um, this new constitution was drafted drafted and adopted by the constituent assembly uh, which has recognized the um, uh, right to uh, live in healthy and clean environment as a fundamental right uh, the victim of environmental pollution and degradation is recognized um, and right to be compensated by the pollutant uh, has been recognized as non derogable fundamental right so the constitution itself has recognized um, uh, as a fundamental right uh, right to be in healthy and clean environment with compensation and uh, not only the um, this because there is also like um, um, policies relating to use of natural resources where 
uh, under the directive principle where they talk about equitable distribution and benefits um, benefits of uh, natural resources. And they even mention like sustainable use of diversity, minimize the negative impact of industrialization. Um, and uh, they also um, have, a poli uh, have a policy for physical development by promoting public awareness on envi environment cleanness and protection. At the same time, the directive principle also recognize sustainable environment development based on pre-warning and pre-informed agreement regarding environmental protection. So in addition to this, the constitution itself has now established a national natural um, uh, natural resource and physical commission. Uh, this commission has been created uh, to look into the potential dispute on uh, distribution of natural resources among center, um, uh, from center, state, and local government. So this um, uh, this constitutional provision, along with uh, being party to different um, different um, conventions uh, related to environment mental justice which includes like Ramsar Convention, Ozone Layer Convention, Convention on the Biological Diversity has also created um, um, opportunity, uh, opportunity not only for judicial activism, because when this constitution did not exist, there was a lot of cases decided through the judicial activism. Now we have opportunity for the constitutional activism. And we also have a new law on environmental protection um, known as Environmental Protection Act, which was created in 2019. So Nepali Supreme Court has been actively um, engaged in holding government and private institution accountable in their action, insufficient action or negative action. And has uh, become a, a, a tool to advance environmental policy, um, policy to reform the law. Uh, it has also been invoking different uh, human rights instruments, including uh, different other normative uh, framework adopted through different uh, conferences, declaration in its judgment. And um, um, uh, right now, we have two cases uh, in the court. Uh, one is uh, related to uh, encroachment of uh, river and pollution of river, uh, as well as another case, which is uh, waste management in Himalayan region, especially in Mount Everest area, uh, which is a touristic area, but, um, but uh, wastes are not managed on continuous mandamus. So we have been giving orders in each um, uh, case date uh, to improve certain aspect and the government comes back with what improvements are made. So this is a new uh, concept which we have been practicing since last few years, um, not to finalize the case, but giving the continuous mandamus. And there are many other cases which um, um, I will not mention at this point. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, but what is important um, um, important um, uh, for for many of us that court, uh, even in the absence of um, um, uh, absence of new constitutional provision, they expressed life does not only refer to mere existence. It incorporates all those facets that are an integral part of life itself and those matters which go to form the quality of life. Uh, it also, the court has also said in another case, there is no true development in the just destruction of environment. Uh, the court also says, give meaning to traditional understanding of our, our relationship with the environment. Not only the right to nature, but also right of nature and dignity of nature to be in center of justice. So the court has already reiterated the importance of precautionary principles, sustainable development, polluters pay principle, as well as public trust document doctrine in different cases. So for the use of, um, of, of student, uh, we would like to highlight some of the judgment some of the judgment um, um, uh, in, in, uh, in little bit uh, detail and I will uh, I want my, my colleague to share um, uh, the case on uh, the la latest case on 
on um, Nisgard, which is um, uh, which is uh, like uh, where uh, the biodiversity was affected, uh, wildlife were affected uh, in the name of construction of new airport. Um, hello, uh, I will be uh, explaining about the in the new the recent case of the Nijgard International Airport. Uh, this is the 2021 case. Uh, the verdict was given in 2021. The case uh, began in 2018 when a group of uh, environment lawyers and activists filed a petition against uh, uh, the development project plan of the of, of Nepal of uh, the Nepal government, which was about building an international airport in the Nijgard area. Nijgard area. Uh, giving a little background about the Nijgard area, it is an area in the plains, the Tarai plains of Nepal which is um, uh, home to dense forest and uh, given it's um, the, the trees there are hundreds of years old and the biodiversity it is a corridor uh, it's a corridor pass for wildlife and it is also um, considered as lungs of nepal in uh, we, uh, we consider Nish, the forest area area in the nishgur as lungs of nepal and it's very close to a very um, an essential national park which is the porsa wildlife uh, national park and wildlife reserve so it's very close to that region as well so uh, because of these this region uh, this reason these reasons it is um, important environmentally and the biodiversity there is um, um, uh, is is important not just in term, not just for nepal but like because uh, the rare animals rare species are found there so it would be dangerous for the endangered species as well so the construction of an airport which would require cutting down of around uh, 61.2 million trees uh, to build the airport that they were planning so a petition was filed uh, claiming that this is uh, this is against the principle uh, against the um, fundamental rights of the people living around that area and against the state policies directive principle and uh, the petitioners also invoked the treaty act of nepal stating that uh, given the airport uh, uh, construction takes place it would violate nepal's international obligations to the treaties it has been it is party to and uh, breach its international obligations so a petition was filed on this manner so the decision of the uh, decision of the court it was a, a, a case, case presented in the constitutional bench of nepal and uh, the the ratio was uh, to uh, there was a concurrent opinion among the five judges who were present so the, the ratio was 3 is to 2 and the majority opinion of uh, the court was the majority opinion uh, the majority bench was of the opinion that uh, construction of such a large project in Nijgod would require a lot of um, research and assessment before and uh, given uh, the context that the EIA, the environment impact assessment that was done in this project uh, was approved just uh, in two months time and normally even for a small project it would require at least six months time to prepare an EIA to um, go through the uh, the impacts of it but this was this was done in just amount of two months and it did not take into amount uh, the loss of biodiversity or uh, the impact that would cause throughout the nation and even to the surrounding uh, countries and also the fact that cutting down of large number of tree trees would lead to disasters and intensify the already um, occurring floods and um, heavy rainfall, uh, 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 heavy rainfall, and such such situations of disaster. So none of this was taken into account. And none of this was taken into account, and uh, um, the, the the project went forward without uh, um, without without any uh, precaution or without any protective me measure. Uh, so and uh, again uh, to add. Um, uh, the minority opinion was also of the was was also. Uh, not against the idea of protection of biodiversity, but they took a different approach towards how this project should go forward. But the majority opinion, they went on to say that all of the decisions that has been done in regard to the construction of this Nijgard airport would be quashed. And uh, they, the EIA that was done uh, did not seem like it was done uh, meticulously or uh, according to the standards that has been prescribed by the uh, policies or the laws. Uh, so invoking Nepal's national laws, multiple laws regarding environment and the international laws and keeping in mind the principles of sustainable development, which has been cited multiple times. A very beautiful thing that has been quoted in this uh, 
uh, in this decision is that when the court talks about development, it, it the word development itself in itself uh, includes the idea of sustainable development. So when we say development, it is to be understood that uh, it ought to be sustainable. Any development work that is not sustainable cannot be considered development itself. So uh, given the fact that this would not be sustainable and for a country, uh, for a small country like Nepal, which already has a few international airports and to build an airport on a large area about uh, 8,000 hectare uh, land. Normally it's 2,000 for even big cities. So it did not make sense even from a logical uh, perspective that a large airport is such was required in Nepal. So the majority opinion absolutely quashed all the decisions. And um, and what it did, did, but it did deem necessary the building of an airport uh, given Nepal's, uh, uh, for the Nepal's tourism and other uh, development activities, it would be necessary uh, to have an airport. So, uh, so it would be necessary to um, build an airport. So uh, they gave an order to cancel all the uh, previous decisions but uh, if, if if the if the, if the authorities uh, who are in charge the, the the tourism and the development authorities seem deem necessary then they would have to conduct an eia with proper consultation and uh, given uh, and taking um, prior uh, taking the taking into account the um, locals opinion public's opinion so those would have to be necessary which as we see is very important part of the international uh, environment law as uh, talked about consultation about prior informed and about protection measures so all of this has been taken into account and obviously it talks about sustainable development is the basis of any activities that need to be done uh, so Unless, um, um, so it, the airport should be built only in a place that does not amount to, yes, uh, yes some minimal amount of loss that can be repaired, no irreparable loss uh, should be an outcome of development project. So the airport can be built, but it should be done in a manner that uh, does not amount to large amount of loss uh, to biodiversity or to the environment uh, uh, of any part of uh, any part of Nepal. Uh, the minority opinion was also of similar view, but they did not completely deny the building of airport in this uh, um, in this Nishgad area. Uh, the minority opinion uh, gave uh, their uh, verdict that uh, this this can uh, this project can move, go on, but they would have to plant um, equally uh, the amount of trees that would have been destroyed or uh, that had to be taken down for the construction of the airport. So they would have to make sure that the loss that happened during the construction of this project would be recovered through other measures. And since Nepal is uh, involved in carbon trading and Nishgarh area is the carbon sink of Nepal, so uh, taking into account that, uh, uh, that part as well, uh, the number of trees should be like that. Uh, the ratio was if one tree of Nishgarh would amount to 25 new saplings that needed to be um, uh, that need to be planted again. So uh, taking all of this into account, the airport uh, would have to be built uh, by making sure that uh, the damage that would uh, that would that the damage this construction would cause would be recovered. And obviously, the majority opinion was held, and now uh, the decision of the majority opinion was held, and all the decisions that rega regarding Nijgarh Airport was quashed. So uh, this decision is a very celebrated decision by uh, environment lawyers and uh, even the judiciary. But um, it was met with um, a, 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 a complete, it was met with. Um, political uh, questions about whether or not it is right or wrong but again the court uh, did not enter into the political part but rather just stayed on the principles uh, given by the constitution and the principle of sustainable development and principle of protection of biodiversity that was uh, that is a state policy that is uh, uh, under the directive or, or the directive principles and state policies of Nepal so um, based on the constitution and international laws the building of Nijgarh International Airport was cancelled uh, by the decision of Supreme Court. So this is a very recent and a very uh, landmark case of Nepal uh, regarding protection of biodiversity. So uh, I would like to give an example of another uh, case as well. Uh, it's similar to uh, the um, Nijgarh case is another 2022 case of uh, a Chure range. Chure range is... Uh, 
it's 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 a hilly mountainous range ranging from hindukush yeah. uh, hindukush himalayan range it 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 falls within that himalayan range and ranges to india pakistan as well the names might be different there but in nepal it's called chure range and uh, the the budget uh, speech the, the the facts of the case are as uh, is that uh, the budget the preliminary budget um, uh, was the preliminary budget speech the preliminary draft of budget of nepal for the year 2020 2022 for the year 2021 sorry 2020 2021 was uh, um was made uh, was drafted and uh, the one of the income source of income was listed by the finance ministry as uh, ex uh, extraction of minerals from uh, the sture range and uh, exporting it to a uh, foreign country especially to india so that was one of the base for uh, source of income and uh, a, a petition was filed by again environment lawyers and activists that uh, extracting a gravel stone and such materials from this range and from uh, sea, uh, the river beds uh would uh, would would cause massive loss to the biodiversity of nepal and would result in uh, disasters again flooding is a major issue in nepal and it will result in flooding and uh, like justice mallo mentioned the uh, glacial lake um, uh, bursting and melting of glaciers this would uh, a lot of uh, human act anthropo uh, human activities in this these ranges would result in uh, damage to the conditions of, uh, to, to the biodiversity and also to the weather conditions of nepal uh, given that there's a huge amount of trees and biodiversity residing in the chure range as well uh so the budget speech was the budget draft was eventually changed but since the pil was already there in the court uh the constitutional this is also a decision of the constitutional bench the constitutional bench proceeded with the judgment saying that yes the issue has uh, now been settled uh, because the uh the finance ministry changed their budget in the uh, final budget uh, the budget speech but um again the fact that such an issue uh the 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 um, that such an issue might come up so the judiciary deems important that uh, it is that uh, we give our opinion and uh, draft necessary and uh, uh, give directive orders to draft necessary policies to prevent any such activities or any such plans from uh, being formulated further so this case was uh, tell this case was proceeded with and did not um, cancel by just uh, the uh, the uh, change in the budget uh, draft so uh, year two the court talks about uh, uh, right or uh, again right of right of nature and right to nature both so it includes the harmony of relation between humans and nature and uh, it should not be disturbed and um, uh, also so one of the major factor of this uh, uh, outcome of this case was it talks about ecocide which is not uh, a, a legal it's not uh, much it's not uh, it has not been included in legal instruments internationally yet i guess and not much in many uh, legislations in other jurisdictions as well but uh, nepal uh, the judiciary in this uh, in this case has talked about ecocide saying widespread damage to environment conditions and widespread damage to biodiversity that would result in irreparable loss would amount to ecocide and uh, Uh, that would not be acceptable under any conditions and uh, financial reasons cannot be uh, given as uh, financial reasons cannot be justifiable for such amount of loss so under no conditions can uh, this chuya range or any other such uh, large area of large environmental and biodiversity importance uh, should be um, uh, should be destroyed or uh, should be disturbed for financial reasons and um, again lastly this uh, another important aspect of this decision is it 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 talks about sustainable development of sustainable development as the most essential the most fundamental among all the um, um, uh, state policies of nepal it is the most fundamental policy so uh, this cannot in any condition be avoided so the most fundamental principle of constitution of, uh, of the constitution of nepal is sustainable development is one principle that this uh, uh, decision propounded and um, with uh, with with and it gave directive orders that such such uh, when policies are made by the executive it should keep into account this policy says and should not uh, um give financial re financial causes as reasons for damage to environment so these two principles are the these two cases are the recent development in nepal which have been uh, which have cited multiple international laws and has large influence of 
um, the global environment laws as, um, as such as the principles of sustainable development, precautionary principle, and of course, uh, the principle of intergenerational equity, which has been cited multiple times in both of these uh, judgments. So again. Thank you, Shreya, for sharing two uh, important cases. Um, cases. Uh, yes, uh, we have been criticized extensively um, by the politics, uh, but we we said uh, it's it's uh, our own constitution. It's our international norms itself recognizes environmentally sustainable development. So we are not talking about new forms of development, but we are talking about environmentally sustainable development. I want to share one case, which was from my own bench. This is Anfiwa Lake, a famous touristic location in Nepal, Pokhara. Uh, due to the encroachment of lake, a lake was shrinking. Uh, the court ordered to take necessary, um, uh, necessary precautionary uh, measure to minimize the additional risk uh, to the conservation of Fiawa Lake, including making arrangements to remove houses, hotels, um, uh, permanently or temporarily constructed 65 meters from the bank of the lake to maintain the water level in Fiawa Lake. And to preserve the dignity of lake, the court ordered that Fiwa Lake to be declared a protected water watershed area. It also ordered to implement recommendation given in the study uh, for the conservation of the lake because there's a, some study which has already been committed known as a Lamichane report. It has also issued guideline with programmatic intervention with the timeline to implement the judgment because sometimes implementation of the judgment is quite uh, difficult. And therefore here we have not only um, gave order, but we also gave timeline uh, and, and with, with certain plan. Um, um, plan. Uh, in this case, in this case, uh, and the ratio, the ratio which was, um, which was uh, built up, uh, through the case is that uh, the, 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 the ratio says generation is to um, the responsibility of the present gen generation is to ensure for the future generation all the natural cultural heritage, forest, climate, environment, and biodiversity that they have experienced or achieved according to the principle of intergenerational equity. Uh, secondly, it also said in this order. Uh, the work done for the conservation of such resources should have been done in such a way to preserve such resources in natural condition. And further, say, development uh, th that has jeopardized the very existence of nature by uncontrolled and undiscriminate encroachment or exploitation is temporary and does not adhere to the principle of sustainable development. Therefore, a balance between natural resources and development, reducing the exploitation of nature and preserving it for the future generation is critical. So this judgment is very, very much important uh, for us. Uh, but in addition to this, this issue, the other issue in relation to the, uh, the same place came along with this case, because in the bank of Fewa Lake, they were building a um, cable car, a cable car, and the government has already had already made decision, and MOU has uh, had already entered with the private party uh, to build the cable car, and uh, the PIL came to repeal the government decision and MOU. Uh, to build the ropeway where uh, the court said uh, uh, make policies that harmonize uh, with the construction work uh, within the boundaries of natural and cultural heritage such as Fewale. Um, the, the court uh, said uh, due to the Fewale Pokhara is the main tourist destination in Nepal and uh, necessary initiatives should be taken to include it in the World Heritage List. And the ratio was again in this case uh, to create an environment where citizens can use uh, the um, uh, such lake in easy, easily 
Since living in a polluted environment is bound to have an adverse effect on one's health, living in a pollution-free environment is intrinsically linked with one's right to live. The environment must be clean for its guarantee. For the purity of the environment, it needs to protect as things like forest, lake, ponds, river, uh, clean air, water, environmental balance. As the guardian of the interest of the citizen, it is indisputable that the state has the responsibility to protect rights and interests of the people. Uh, it also said it is not possible to compromise with the sustainable development in a way that will have a negative impact on the environment. So the few cases which we have shared, we have um, are quite important for us. But then uh, due to the time, we want to now go into some of the challenges um, the court is confronting with uh, non-implementation as I mentioned before, is a big issue. Uh, but one strategy, one approach um, uh, that is being taken place at the moment uh, to follow up non-implementation issue by, again, PIL lawyers uh, through the contempt of court cases. So contempt of court, uh, court cases have become a tool for the enforcement of judgment. Recently, in one of the follow-up cases of contempt court ordered central government to coordinate with the provincial and local government to prepare plan with monitoring mechanism with indicators to implement its previous decision that bans use of plastic under 40 microns. So what is important here is that when it comes to the environmental injustice issues, paradigm of judgment writing has also to be shifted. Judgment has to be visionary. Judgment has to be have a mitigation plan and programs. And again, one thing like where, what we have been confronting in judgment delivery process, especially in protecting nature, um, we, are, we have uh, lots of difficulties in establishing harm. And unless we establish harm, uh, difficult to decide how to compensate. So, what is the problem in the judgment delivery process is we don't have a enough research, we lack evidences, we lack technical expertise, we lack connection with science and technology. I want to give one example, like uh, when we were talk, we talk about uh, the glacier has been melting so fast, and uh, in one of the program, um, someone asked me. Uh, have you been measuring how fast glacier is melting? Do you have any tool? I have to say, we don't have any, any technology, any tool to measure how fast it is melting. And therefore it's very important for us to connect with the science, connect with technology. Uh, also, um, other challenge is lack of people, um, people to challenge the bad governance in accountability issues with research-based evidences. Again, like talking about uh, environmental harm, uh, yes, uh, identification harm uh, of harm, uh, nature of harm is, is, is complex. Effect of harm is complex. Causes of harm and identifying responsible agency, whether it's government, whether it's private sector, within the private sector, if it's a national institution or multinational companies or for foreign government, because identification of those key uh, responsible agency is critical to create accountability. Uh, and then shifting the responsibility to repair environmental harm under different jurisdiction is not easy. Justiciability of um, um, uh, justiciability in transnational nature of harm is not easy because uh, there is no global substantive and procedural legal framework and mechanism uh, to uh, create accountability uh, for transnational nature of harm uh, at the international level. Um, I'll stop here. I'll stop here um, because we may have some questions uh, where, where then, then I can come back. Uh, we can come back to you. 
Thank you so much, Justice Mala, and uh, both of you for your very insightful uh, explanations of the of the most recent judgments in the legal framework and the constitution. I'm really impressed to see that you know the Nepal Sustainable Development has such a high uh, standing as a state objective and a principle in the constitution. That's really interesting, and I hope uh, that the audience can now start typing some questions in the Q and A section or in the chat section. I can read it out. Um, while um, our students and, and the audience are doing that, I would like to ask one question myself. Um, I understand that you said that the international legal frameworks have played a huge role in these judgments. And I was wondering, especially in the one concerning the airport, for example, how important is the Paris Agreement or, or the entire UNFCCC regime? How is that applicable? Will this be considered as a legal argument or would it be rather be a policy implication or how does it frame the entire discussion? That would be really interesting to, to hear a little bit more about that. Thank you very much. Can, can we take all the questions? Yes, let's see whether they are. So sometimes it just needs a little bit of an icebreaker, which I hope I've just uh, done. There's nothing at the moment, so we can as well go with this one first and see if there are more. No, I mean, yes, uh, we are aware about uh, the, the Paris Agreement. Uh, through which we have been able to discuss extensively in some of the judgment on adop adaptation plan, mitigation plan. Um, it is a legal instrument, although it has uh, lots of gaps, um, gaps, uh, but um, uh, with uh, the ratification of this um, convention, we have been able to uh, give a judgment uh, to uh, enact a comprehensive legislation on for climate justice um, on, on climate change uh, because we don't have a specific legislation. The convention is a legally binding document in case of Nepal because uh, we follow a monistic approach, uh, approach um, unless it is inconsistent with the constitution uh, um, uh, to address the gap of the law or, 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 or um, to create um, other accountability mechanism, Paris Convention is very much important uh, for the climate justice. But again, question is um, how much um, it has helped to cover comprehensive um, uh, environmental um, uh, right related issues. Uh, therefore, the discussion is there to call for a comprehensive um, global uh, framework uh, to deal with um, um, environmental justice. Although even in the absence of this um, international framework, um, a specific uh, framework, in addition to the Climate um, Justice Convention, the Paris Convention, uh, in Nepal, we have been using the other normative framework like Stockholm Declaration, Rio Declaration in our judgment. Uh, judgment. The principle are very, very important. That is uh, adopted um, uh, by those uh, declaration in designing, um, in writing our judgment, in designing um, our recommendation. Um, as I mentioned, we have been using almost all the uh, principles. So I think what uh, we have been uh, doing is uh, using those principles as a founding ground to expand our jurisprudence. So in addition to the Paris Convention, I would say we are more relying on, on, the, on, the, on the principles uh, that is um, founded by uh, different uh, declarations. Okay, sir. Thank you very much uh, for the comprehensive answer. There is one suggestion and one more question in the chat now. So there's one um, recommendation, an article that may assist in measuring glacial ice melt in the Himalayas in Nepal. Uh, I'm quite sure you can access the Q&A section. So if you want to um, copy yeah. that, um, and I can also send that to you. And I could also add to that because we've got a colleague who is working um, with the 
uh, cryosphere initiative and he's also looking into glacier ice and ice melting and how glaciers change uh, they do modeling and, and that is within the uh, center for sustainable development law and policy so i would be delighted to make contacts there if that is um, useful and also to mention there's some um, new jurisprudence coming from the international court of justice in terms of estimating environmental damage and compensation and some approaches uh, that have been used there. Uh, very young development, uh, very recent development from 2018. And then there's a question from Justice Preston. Is Nepal a dualist uh, legal system? If so, how do the Nepalese courts incorporate international law and norms into their judgments? For example, principles of the environmental rule of law that are not already incorporated in the constitution or statutes. Can you give examples of judgments where this has been done? That's from Justice Preston. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Justice Pritson, uh, for the wonderful question. And then also, um, uh, thank you for sharing and the study on, 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 uh, the, uh, on, on how major, the glacier melting can be measured. So I think that will be very much uh, useful for us. I will download and, and, and keep uh, for ourselves and also share with uh, my colleagues in the court. Um, in regards to the question uh, raised by Justice um, uh, Pritson, uh, yes, uh, Nepal is um, the, the um, treaty jurisprudence uh, Nepal has been following is is uh, more uh, monistic rather than dualistic. And um, uh, therefore, like uh, the, we also have a separate treaty act. And we already have uh, many uh, practices, uh, many precedents where uh, the monistic approach has been recognized through the judgment of the court, especially when it comes to the um, when it comes to the um, um, the internet mainstreaming uh, human rights framework, mainstreaming framework. Uh, but. Um, um, but the question is uh, like, uh, what about other other uh, norms, other principles? Um, we have multiple cases, uh, multiple cases uh, here, like where uh, different uh, principles. Uh, uh, like, for example, like uh, in case of Prakash Mani Sharma versus Godavari Marble case, uh, the principle of uh, sustainable development is recognized as non-negotiable, uh, non-negotiable. Similarly, uh, I was talking about the, I was talking about um, this um, um, landmark judgment of Fewa Lake, where uh, the court has, uh, court has recognized the uh, principle of intergenerational equity. Um, um, similarly, in case of um, uh, plastic ban, ban the judgment, uh, I can send the details of those judgment where these principles are applied. Uh, we have already applied precautionary principle, uh, principles. Uh, the polluters pay principle has already been applied in, uh, in uh, this uh, Chitwan National Park case, uh, um, uh, the case number is 10 2004, uh, where the government uh, needs to understand, reflect the fact that natural resources are the property of all the people of the nation, present and future, and therefore um, polluters people. Intergenerational. Huh? intergenerational. Uh, therefore, intergenerational. Uh, rights of the people have to be protected. So there are many judgments where uh, the principles are applied. Uh, but um, uh, what we can do is uh, for the for the benefit of uh, students, uh, we can send a short brief of the judgments uh, where these principles are applied. That would be extremely helpful. Thank you so much. It's really interesting to hear about this because there's nothing that is easily accessible for us here. 
uh, and it will be very interesting for research, but also for teaching purposes. Thank you. Um, there's a further question now in, in the chat. So it's um, an anonymous attendee. Thank you very much for your interesting presentations. Uh, the constitutional environmental duty of the state in Nepal framed as a directive principle is not judicially enforceable. On what basis does the judiciary invoke this constitutional provision? Thank you. Uh, so uh, I will be taking the second question regarding uh, the invocation of uh, regarding the use of the directive principle. And um, uh, the, uh, for this question, I would like to give an example of a previous case, which was about uh, it was a case concerning the concerning uh, the construction of a medical school on the riverbed of a, um, on on riverbeds of a river that is uh, uh, that is uh, religiously important and also environmentally, uh, as it would be uh, as many households relied on the uh, on that river. So uh, the uh, when this case came there, Nepal did not have specific fundamental right uh, regarding um, clean regarding right to environment. So the approach that court took was uh, the petitioner is uh, invoked again the state policies like the state has a policy to not um, destroy or not breach the natural not uh, destroy the natural resources so uh, what the court said in this case was uh, state policies are um, they're not uh, judicially enforceable does not mean one can go against the judicial against those principles so uh, you may not be able to immediately enforce certain things but uh, since it is the since the constitution has the aspiration to move towards and uh, towards sustainable development towards preservation of natural resources so uh, by citing uh, by by using this technical ground that this is not judicially judicially enforceable does not mean that one can go against it so this based on this this principle the uh, judgments of the court have uh, used the state policies as uh, a guideline or as a uh, or as it says, directive directive way of uh, guiding the executive bodies or uh, or the private entities uh, towards uh, preservation of environment. So uh, again, does not the, uh, this does not bar not being judicially enforceable has not barred the judiciary from using these principles as um, a guideline in deciding cases. Yes, uh, Shreya has already responded because uh, yes, uh, one hand, judicial—I mean, directive principles are not uh, directly judicially enforceable, but uh, the government uh, policy, government program, uh, law cannot be against um, uh, against uh, the principles, and there are many instances where uh, the direction has been given by the court. To look into the policy uh, as a as a as an overarching framework uh, framework um, and uh, uh, lots of programs uh, budgets are also allocated uh, based on the directive principle. But in Nepal right now, um, uh, the, the the environment of, uh, you know the, the constitutional provision uh, of fundamental rights in regards to uh, environmental justice is quite uh, comprehensive. And in regards to EIA, I think the um, in the case of uh, this uh, Nisgar Airport, uh, this issue came up uh, very strongly because they challenged the petitioner challenged the EIA itself because uh, the um, uh, they did not um, uh, do the comprehensive uh, environmental impact assessment in the project. Uh, so the when the court gave order, they said take into account the potential impact on the environment, forest, wildlife in the area. The court also ordered the government to make result of EIA public and to obtain the consent of local communities before proceeding with the construction uh, construction of the airport of qualified um, uh, uh, airport uh, okay. with qualified also with the qualified independent experts. Thank you very much. And that ties in well with the next question. And that comes from uh, Judith Preston. And she's asking, did the petitioners argue the existence of an inadequate EIA for the proposed excavation development play a part in the outcome in the Salendra case? 
Uh, so in the Sailendra case, um, there was not much discussion about the EIA because um, again the um, this the, uh, in, in this uh, in, in year the uh, the court did say that if the EIA has not been done properly and if uh, there seems to be some uh, malefic intent or some um, um, uh, some uh, 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 this was, uh, like it is not justifiable, not reasonable, or there seems to be some problem, then if uh, the ones who've conducted the EIA uh, will be under investigation. So the court has not will that the court has proposed the, um, the drafting of policies and laws regarding the accountability of the um, uh, the experts or the um, uh, ones who conduct the EIA. So uh, briefly, only the, there's been a mention about the environment impact is assessment in the uh, Sailendra case because I uh, did not go much into the facts of the case as the budget was already, the budget, uh, the, the, the the issue that brought the case was already cancelled. So we did not go much into the details. But yeah, it does mention that EIA should be, uh, again, uh, there should be some level of accountability of the uh, the responsible authorities who have conducted EIA. So that has been talked about in the Salindra case. Thank you very much. Um, if I may ask another question, it's actually a twofold question. So the first is you mentioned that there is an issue with enforcement of judgments. And I was wondering, is that something that is more pertaining to the environmental law jurisprudence? Um, and uh, related to that, um, how is it normally um, achieve that judgments are followed through? Is it by giving a timeline or set a penalty if it's not being fulfilled? Or um, what, what is normally the process in those instances? Thank you. Giving timeline is a new trend because of non-implementation. Uh, because we felt it will be easier to monitor and um, judgment execution directorate has been uh, established within the court. So that is another achievement because with every uh, judgment, especially the re on read petition issue, uh, read um, against the government, uh, all the case judgments are sent to the judgment execution directorate and they will follow with uh, relevant government agency, responsible government agency, uh, how uh, to uh, how it has been executed and they will also ask the reports this is one way of following up by the court otherwise we i mean uh, the traditional approach here is like once judgment is given our responsibility is over but what we have realized having judgment is not, not enough it has to be translated in the life of the people it has to be um, uh, executed it has to be realized by the people so we have now this new new idea of uh, giving timeline, giving like a um, plan. So uh, as I said in the beginning, because the approach of um, um, environmental justice has to be a little bit different, uh, uh, paradigm has to be shifted in the judgment itself. Uh, otherwise uh, implementation as it requires some time, lots of, um, uh, resources, it re requires political uh, commitment uh, and therefore to make even the politics uh, accountable, uh, sometimes follow-up uh, mechanism is critical. And we are happy that now the government of Nepal has, uh, the cabinet has its own executive sex, uh, implement uh, judgment enforcement uh, committee. Similarly, even the pub, uh, public attorney office has adjustment execution committee. Uh, so uh, if we compare with uh, different judgments we have been issuing, um, uh, issuing um, um, in regards to environmental justice, uh, few judgments are executed, but uh, majority of judgment are yet to be executed. But we are very happy to see latest two judgment. One is the silent case on Huh? Chure. The Chure excavation and also this Nisgard case, uh, they have already implemented and government has now um, uh, restricted um, not only excavation but also importing the, the stones outside the country. So it has been imme implemented immediately. Uh, secondly, 
um, uh, in case of Nizgarh Airport, the government has already done a new EIA, uh, new EIA, and um, uh, they are following up uh, the instructions given by court um, uh, to to uh, see how they can minimize. So the mitigation approach uh, has been respected uh, by the government, and they are looking into uh, the mitigation plan on how, how the harm can be minimized uh, and which area, how much area is important, whether they need to cover all the areas which was proposed before, or they can even minimize the coverage area and how the harm um, that can happen to the wildlife or to the, the, the number of trees which was proposed to cut down can be minimized. So they have been working on it. So we are happy that uh, the, with the recent judgment, um, some positive initiative has already been taken by the government, but at the same time, um, uh, for example, fewer lake case, still, I mean, they measure, they, we said, measure the, the, land, the, the area of lake, they started measuring, and when it came to, uh, when it came to remove uh, the construction, uh, identifying which is a legal construction, which is an illegal construction, whether it's a government land or private land, those uh, action has not been taken and they are still confronting how to put um, 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 uh, this 65 meters um, uh, buffer zone uh, from the bank because lots of construction has already been made and lots of politics is taking place. Thank you so much. I think it was, it was very comprehensive and insightful, but it also gives us enough to maybe collaborate further on some of these issues that you identified. So I, I really, again, appreciate your time and thank you so much for your insights, for sharing your views. I don't think there are any other questions at the moment. So, um, but we will keep this uh, momentum going. We are not stopping here. This is just the beginning. And uh, I'm very grateful for both of uh, your time and, and your insights and your preparation that has gone into this. So thank you again very much. Yes, thank you to you uh, for connecting with, uh, connecting with us in this program and uh, have, a, have a good evening.